ask you to, when you do your question, probably because of the federal laws about HIPAA, got to be careful, don't say, well, I personally have this. You might want to, in a general term, say, if a patient has this, because I'm a little reluctant to discuss your medical problem with the person right next to you. It's kind of a privacy thing. So, general questions? Um, I was reading on the internet something about in 2010, earlier this year, there was a um, successful surgery, not sure if it was decompression surgery or not, but on a PR patient um, laparoscopically. So, so, endoscopically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was uh, probably it. What so not through the nasal cavity? We do a lot of endoscopic surgery. Go ahead. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. So um, the question was: Can the real question um, was? Did someone do surgery on the back of the brain through the nasal cavity? Uh, no, the answer is no for that. But the question is a really good one, and the question is: Can you do the surgery through an endoscope? Um, that's been reported for years. The problem is, and I do a lot of endoscopy, a lot of endoscopic surgery, so I'm very comfortable with it. Would I ever do it on the back of the head? No, because the operation, what is the principle of the operation? Is to give the brain more room. Making a small hole means you're going to be back there. Now, technically you can, through an endoscope, take out all the, the bone you want to do, if you're not going to open the door. So the answer is it can be done that way. It probably doesn't save you much. much. The idea of doing it endoscopically, when we do pituitary surgery through the nose, or I do, tomorrow I'm going to do a brain surgery on a patient through an endoscope in the head and take out a tumor, the advantage of that is they recover faster and they go home sooner. But you got to be able to accomplish the mission, and the mission in Chiari operations decompress the brain. So if you do a small operation and you don't accomplish that, not very helpful to the patient. But that's a great question. Um, listening to you about searings, or one searing, or, or maybe multiple searings, I get this understanding from you that you recommend that they always be emptied or. or, or Collapse, wanted to be collapsed. And my understanding is from, from 20 years ago or so on that that was not always done or not even recommended. Okay, so that's a good question. The question is, patient comes in with the syrinx, and what do you consider, that's a really good question, what do you consider successful? That it's all gone? It completely collapsed? Good question, and I was not careful when I spoke. When I say collapse, 50 percent, 80 percent. There was a study just out of NIH two years ago, excellent study, which looked at the um, curies and syringomyelias, and the patients that got better didn't have to have their syrinxes completely collapsed, but they said that at least 50 percent of it, 50 to 80 percent of it, was decreased, so it wasn't so distended. Well, what is distended? It didn't look like a balloon. Maybe it looked like a deflated balloon. So I always tell my patients, that's a good question. I don't think you can make all the time the syrinx just disappear. And there are plenty of people that say, boy, I feel 100% better or 90% better or 70% better, but their syrinx isn't completely gone. So as a surgeon, my goal is to decrease the distension. And I have some patients that have a 99% collapse of their syrinx, but they still have terrible problems. I have other people whose syrinx collapses 50% and their problems are all gone. And so what I said in the beginning goes that the patient to the right or the left of you may have something that looks quite similar to you, but might have a different result or a different symptom might have come with totally different symptoms. And that's one of the problems with this condition is that it's what we call protein. In other words, it can present any way and the results can be all over the board. So that's an excellent question. Our goal is to see the distension of the serums come down, but there are plenty of people where that doesn't happen and they're doing much better.
Yes. Can a person with uh, long-term high intracranial pressure develop a cervix because of too much pressure? Great question. And where's your lovely daughter tonight? She didn't want to come. Oh, this is one of them. Oh, this is the, I know the other one, yes. I love, I have a lovely daughter at home because you fixed her. Okay, so <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, that's a great question. So the answer is yes. So sometimes what we see <clears throat> is pressure so high in the head. And this happens in patients with pseudotumor, patients with hydrocephalus, patients with Chiari 2, where the fluid pushes the brain downward, causes an acquired Chiari. Uh, the lady I showed you with the aneurysm, she didn't come in with hydrocephalus. She developed hydrocephalus after a bleed. People didn't recognize that her brain herniated down, and she developed one of the worst syrinxes I've ever seen, terrible pain. And, you know, one of the things that happened is people said, well, you're lucky you're alive, your aneurysm is fixed. But she says, I don't feel so lucky because my hands are burning up. So the answer is the hydrocephalus can push fluid down, push the brain down, and also can push fluid through something called the central canal, which communicates to the spinal cord. The second question related to that is, um, you mentioned people complain of their shunts breaking on one of them. Yes. Um, so I know. Being, what is being done? Because patients have no control over the shunt makers. So <clears> are doctors working on the shunt makers to develop something more reliable? Uh, you, uh, you, you ask a great question. One of my partners, uh, and I'm going to shout out to him, he's not here, Sam Browd, okay, just got a grant to develop a self-cleaning shunt, a self-fixing shunt. Mm -hmm. So the technology now is, I mean, this is futuristic. Think about the greatest technological advance in shunts in the last 10 years, okay, has been that programmable valve that, that have a higher breakage rate. <coughs> right. But. 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 In fact, we're just publishing a paper that shows it has a higher breaking rate, but maybe a less return to the operating room to change out the valves. So there is a lot of research being done on what's the best shunt technology. If a pacemaker could be read from across town to see what your, your heart's doing, it seems like a shunt should be able to be made so not only does it last, but it could be followed to see what your pressure is. So that's part of it. Now, there was something called the telesensor shunt 20 years ago made where you can do that, but it was totally unreliable because the technology, we didn't have nanotechnology back then. To, the telesensor was that big. You can imagine how many people wanted that, right? So uh, this new shunt that Sam Brad is designing has a sensor in it. That can, Oh, well, it's, uh, the, you know what, the technology is still being worked on. These are the things that from the bench, realistically, I always, you know, it's like you discover a drug. If tomorrow we discovered the drug to treat an arrhythmia or a cancer, from the time it made it from the lab bench to the person who needed it in Dubuque, Iowa, be 10 years fastest. And do you know how much that drug would cost? Do you know how much it would cost to develop that drug? Does anybody have an idea what it takes to bring to market a new instrument or a new drug? Close to a billion dollars, one billion dollars, 990 million dollars. And that gets to the question is why don't they make more drugs for kids with cancer? Or why don't they Fix, why don't they make more things for people with Chiari's? Because it's considered an orphan condition. So the conditions that get a lot of attention are often the ones with the highest number. Heart disease, everybody gets it. Okay, breast cancer, one out of nine women get it. Alzheimer's. So those, those get a lot of attention because it affects so many millions of people. But then when you get under a million people, the attention drops, and, and you can see why, because it costs so much to bring something from the lab to market. That's just the reality. I'm not making a judgment. That's just what it is. 
you, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, it's a good question. It depends. It, once again, that's one of that. Every individual is different. You know, um, it depends. Um, I think what we do know, what I can tell you we do know, is people with syrinxes that have symptoms will only progressively get worse. And there's probably, most neurosurgeons agree, probably 80, 90 percent agree that you probably should operate on those patients, not wait on them. Although some patients, I had a patient, ballet dancer patient, who absolutely did not want, had a big syrinx, but she did not want to be operated on <coughs> until she couldn't dance anymore. Everybody's different, but good question. How common is it for a patient that has PRA to have um, cervical and spinal stenosis? Because I'm sure it's not common for uh, You know, that's a good question, because really when you think about it, the question was, I'm sorry, Dorothy, uh, let me repeat the question. The question is, how common is it, you know, the associated anomalies, how co common is it for people to have cervical spine disease, stenosis, crushing of the, in addition to the curia? Well, when you think about curia, that is kind of a stenosis, right? It's, a, it, it's too tight a hole in the bottom of the skull, or too small a skull. So the answer is there are, you know, we all get degenerative arthritis of our spine. Well, a lot of us do. And so as we get older, there's a fair number of people that have degenerative arthritis of the spine. And I'm often telling people, there was another patient Monday, who, who she, she said, oh, you know, my curare, I feel great, fixed, thanks. What are you going to do about my five herniated discs, you know? Like so she had a bunch of herniated discs, she had three. And I said, you know, we're just going to watch them, conservative therapy. So I would say in the adult patients, it's probably somewhere in the 10% range, I'm guessing. It's not zero, and it's not 100% that have cervical stenosis in addition or narrowing of the spinal column. This is all new to me into my life within the last three months, but I'm curious, is Chiari um, hereditary? Um, may Marcy Spear rest in peace. Um, the young lady we talked about from Duke University, a professor at Duke University who died of breast cancer, she went out to try to discern that, to try to understand that. And she took all her patients and looked at them and found the paper was f published, and um, I was honored to work with her. She was a wonderful human being. Answer is sometimes. Most of the time, not. It isn't like, what are the hereditary diseases? Well, we know neurofibromatosis is hereditary. And certain types of cancers are hereditary. Um, you know, we know that, like for example, um, there are certain people with breast cancers whose sisters will get it and whose mothers and so on. But cure is a little different. We have families out there. I have three or four families out there whose, you know, dad has it, daughter has it, son has it, okay? But the reason people ask me is it hereditary, and maybe that's why you're asking me, is what do I do about my three kids? And that's, and you know, one of the Good things that I like about my practice is I do both adult neurosurgery and pediatric neurosurgery because I think Chiari as a kid's problem that a lot of adults have that have probably had it all their lives. You know, some of them have acquired it, got it from, you know, a hit, you know, blood in the head and so on. But I ask the mother, well, how do your kids, are they having problems? And if they're not having problems, I don't recommend an MRI. You know, it's the old, don't go looking for something you may not want to find. On the other hand is, well, you know, my son's in the nurse's office three times a week. You know, that would be a red flag to me. Every time he runs around the playground, he grabs his head, or he doesn't want to run around the playground. Just not that active. So I listen to what the mother says, not what the father says, what the mother says. They usually know that you, you know. I, the fathers always love when I discount whatever they say. What about preventing them from certain activities such as 
Um, my mom has it. I always wondered if I had it. I have a daughter, and she's playing soccer and heading the ball. I think about it, like, is that something that's not good? The question is, yeah, that's a great question. Hey, what do you do about people that play sports? Well, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. First, I'm going to answer that. No, I wouldn't stop her from playing soccer. Great sport. I think sports are healthier for kids. Let me just editorialize for a second. Sports are much healthier for kids. What we're trying to fight, what's a big problem in this country more than carrying syringomyelia? Childhood obesity. That's a big problem. And so sports, we know, builds teamwork, builds leadership principles and all that. And we're trying to make sports safer, trying to prevent concussions and all that. But we don't know that it causes Chiari or syringomyelia. But what if you had an operation, and I have a football player, my NCAA football player, with a Chiari. Am I happy about that? No. I didn't want him to go back playing football, but he says, that's what I do, and I'm going to do it. I have a Olympic badminton. I didn't know badminton was an even Olympic sport. <laughs> the guy's about, you know, three, four inches taller than me and a lot faster and stronger. So it is a very competitive sport. And uh, I have a semi-pro basketball player. I send them back to sports. I think sports are good. And the deal is if you have a carry operation, um, there are very few things I don't let you do after the operation if you consider it a success. If I consider it a success and you consider it a success. I don't, I scuba dive, I wouldn't let them go like under 100 feet. I think they would get too much pressure problems, but I let them scuba. I let them dive, let them play sports, but use their judgment. So can they play basketball? Sure, why not? shoot some baskets. Do I like football and wrestling and boxing? Not exactly after a Chiari operation, but there are people that do all those things. So I try to have them avoid um, collision sports like hockey and you know football. But uh, you know, most patients when they're feeling good don't listen to their doctor anyway because they figure they're gonna outlive them. So what's the diff? So the answer is I wouldn't stop your kids from doing that. We don't know that it causes problems. So good question. No syrinx, but um, with altered cerebral spinal fluid flow and other anomalies, um, kind of a two-fold question. Is basilar impression a common associated anomaly to? So uh, the question was, what is basilar impression? Okay, so yes, it's something we operate on. It's, you know, every population is different. The, the, probably the leader in the country in dealing with Basler impression is Arnold Menezes in Iowa, one of the members of our board. And he's been around even a couple of decades longer than I have. And he gets patients from all over the world with Basler impression, which is this area pushing on the brain. It's right here. It's the base of the brain, okay, the odontoid process, the dens, whatever you want to call it, pushing on the brain. So it's not only compression from the back, which is what we see in carry, but also the front. And if you ask him in his pop practice, probably 50% of the patients that come to him have that, because that's what he does. Now, in my practice, probably only 10% of the patients do that. And the importance of basilar impression is, is when patients have basilar impression, Often they have to be decompressed from the back and then have an operation through their mouth called a transoral uh, operation <coughs> to take out the odontoid process and then they need a fusion. So it's a big deal to have basilar impression causing Chiari, big deal. And so the first question is, that's a problem and it happens. Second question. Um, successful. Going from obstructed cerebral spinal fluid flow to a mild cerebral spinal fluid flow, can you talk a little bit about how the respiratory and cardiovascular system, it seems, is related to that cerebral spinal fluid flow? The so, so the question is, let's talk CSF flow dynamics. Now, here's where everybody goes to sleep, okay? okay. So are you ready for uh, talking? Let me see if I can make this more entertaining, okay? <laughs> 
because this is a really this is what I study. This is my research, and I'll and I guarantee you, if you read one of my patients, it's a cure for insomnia. Okay, the pa papers rather one of my papers. So here's the deal. Every time you cough or you laugh or you strain, okay, you block the flow of fluid that goes from north to south in your brain and spinal cord. So when you strain, you go like that, you increase the veins in your neck and your brain, and it stops the flow of fluid that would normally flow from north to south, okay, obstructing that flow. That gives you a headache. So let's say you get an operation that's successful. Well, it's relatively, but every time you go to the bathroom and strain, or you're bending over, you're getting a terrible headache. That may tell you that although your operation may or may not have been a success, the flow's not perfect. You're not 16 anymore. So you can't bend and touch your toes without getting that headache. So you can improve flow of normal fluid, and the flow goes from north to south, and then back from south to north, it goes back and forth, back and forth. Every time your heart beats, several milliseconds later, that blood goes from your heart to your brain, and that causes pulsations that cause your CSF to go from north to south. Okay? So normal people have that, and even they sometimes, when they strain, can get a headache because it can block the fluid and it builds up and gives them a headache. Chiari patients get that all the time. Probably 80% of Chiari patients will come in and have what we call a tussive headache because they're blocking the flow of fluid from north to south every time they strain, every time they bend over, every time they laugh or cough. Okay, So you can fix that but not fix it 100%. And so the flow of fluid, partially obstructed, as you asked me, can still cause you symptoms. So the heart drives blood to your brain. Once in your brain, your brain pulsates up and down, up and down, sitting in a funnel. And that pushes the cerebral spinal fluid north to south, up and down. The block, this is a condition where the block is at that base of the skull, where that hole is, where the spinal cord comes out. Okay, does that make sense at all? With that being said, how important is follow-up imaging? So that's a good question. You know, I, I used to, so when I first started doing this, you know, um, I used to like image patients at three months, then a year, and then have them come back for the next 106 years, and you know. And the problem with that is um, MRIs got really expensive. You know, when I get an M when one of my kids, you know, blows out their knee or something, and I get an MRI and I get the $6,000 bill, I get awfully upset. Okay, and I'm a doctor, okay, and I'm saying 6,000 bucks. So I have um, really, turn down the number of follow-ups and add a CINE CSF flow study, it's another few thousand dollars. Okay, so having children have sensitized me to the cost of medical care that is delivered, okay, and I would argue that for follow-up, which is an excellent question, don't get an MRI after your first post-op MRI. Let's say your first post-op MRI looks pretty good. Don't get an MRI unless you're having problems. Save yourself some money. Now, what's the caveat? What if you have a syrinx and your syrinx hasn't collapsed? Most syrinx is about 75 to 80 percent collapse in the first three months, but some don't. I've had them collapse as late as two years. And believe me, I'm getting off an MRIs. I have one parent that comes back, came back every few months, and then it finally collapsed. I think I prayed hard enough, and it happened. So um, the reality is every patient is different. I am reluctant to get MRIs every year because of the inconvenience to the patients and the cost. So if you're feeling okay, 
don't get an MRI. That's, that's the general principle. And then you. Can you speak to some of the other GRE-related symptoms, memory issues, brain fog? You know, that's, so um, I showed you early on. Um, I, I showed that slide for a reason. The question was, what about the other symptoms? What about the other symptoms? <coughs> Look at all these things. You know, headaches, motor findings, sensory complaints, other findings, uh, all kinds of other, and that's only a, a third. Of, we don't know why people get dizzy. We don't know why people have brain fog or confusion. You know, patients will say, you know, I just, I'm not myself. I and I don't know if it's the medications they're getting, the Neurotin, Topamax, what have you. I don't know if it's the condition. So there are a lot of complaints all over the board for patients with Chiari that include the front of the head, which is not affected at all. Okay, the back of the head, dizziness, double vision. Okay, and patients, one of the most uh, disconcerting problems is, is dizziness. People hate to have the room spin around them. Okay, and one of the reasons I open the door and explore is to make sure the cranial nerves that control that, I, ex I look at them, and make sure that they're not obstructed. Now, 50% of the patients get better from an operation, and I take credit for that. 50% don't, and I say it's the disease, <laughs> right? I mean, so we don't know, is the answer is the doctor doesn't know. So dizziness, swallowing difficulties, we think is a cranial nerve and nerve, brain fog, we just don't understand it yet. You had a question, then you? Yes, um, what I was curious about if a patient has a theory, and they have chronic pain. What would make it where, you know, the pain every couple months flares up and becomes very unbearable or the medication doesn't It's a good question. A great question again. They're really good questions. You guys have been studying up for me. You got ready for me. Um, I would tell you the question was about why do some syrinxes that get pain horrible periods, just horrific, and then they get better for a while, and they flare up again. I have theories about it, but I don't know for sure. Sometimes it's tolerance to the medications. Other times it's you do something, you don't even realize it, you strain, you cough, you turn, which fills up that syrinx, and all it takes is a drop of water or something, or you irritate something there. And then it takes that, when you have a damaged nerve, you know, think about it. The way I think about it is, you know, let's say you have a big bruise on your arm or a big scab, and then you hit it again. Let's say you have a scab on your elbow, then you hit it again. It's three times more painful because the nerve is already damaged. So it becomes hypersensitive. So a syrinx that damaged your spinal cord nerves, they're hypersensitive, damage it a little more, and all of a sudden you have a flare up for months. And it takes a while to calm back down. So that does happen. It's a phenomenon we see with people with syrinxes, and we manage it with medications. Narcotic medications are not great for syringomyelia because the fibers that cause the burning, 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 deep-seated pain are not the fibers that get the best treatment with narcotic. It's all the other stuff. Thank you. Um, I got to tell you, I've become a believer. So the question was pain management. I would say the number one complaint of my patients, besides maybe me, is, um, is pain. Pain, pain, and pain, whether it's headache or burning or something, pain. 
And I have become a believer because I've seen people get it, you know, you know, it's in the front page of the New York Times, Seattle Times papers, front page of Time magazine. There's an overuse of narcotics. It's, there's been an overuse of antibiotics. That's why we have all this MRSA around. Overuse of narcotics to the point where you acclimate to the narcotics and it no longer works. So if you're taking, you know, a hundred of hydromorphone, you've got a fentanyl patch on, and you still hurt, probably not the best technique. What we know, and there's federal law being passed, to really control the amount of narcotics out there because it's not managing pain well. So I became a believer in alternate therapies. Acupuncture, massage. I mean, okay, you can go to the you can go to see a doctor, pay two hundred dollars, get a four hundred dollar procedure, or you can get a sixty dollar massage. And I started seeing my patients go to their holistic medical doctors who do acupuncture, who do ten, and all of a sudden, they, a lot cheaper and better results. So I think that it takes a multidisciplinary approach with pain. Forget about the narcs. You use them when it gets really bad. But there are so many other medications that treat the nerves that cause the pain, whether it be Topamax and Neuron, and, you know. And people have failed on 10 different medications before they find the non-addicting, non-narcotic medication that works for them. And you've got to be with a patient pain doctor who will go and try you on different ones. You right. might ask a question for um, Yeah, there are people, that's a good question, there are people with bowel and bladder incontinence and problems, but the reason that happens is because, it's a really good question, she asked why do people mostly get problems with the upper part of their body, not the lower part? because most of the syrinxes are in the cervical region. Only 4% of the syrinxes are in the thoracic region, which would tell you that you get problems in the lower part. People with tethered cords often have bowel and bladder issues. People with syrinxes in their conus medullaris, which is in the thoracic spinal cord, which is in the lower back, get bowel and bladder problems. But the majority of the syrinxes happen close to the curie and that's why you can it, it, it can get you can get nerves uh, numbness from the legs you can so announce it yes sir um, about syrinx it's not always caused by excess fluid in your head or curie it can happen is it hereditary or is it due to some kind of trauma um, the question was, what causes syrinxes? And that was, boy, it's like you have read the book and we're going to write it tonight. It's a great question. The majority of the syrinxes that we see are associated with Curie because this is the Curie and Syringo Myelia Foundation. But the majority of syrinxes that I see, okay, are from trauma. This is a level one trauma center serving five states. And when I was in the Army, the Vietnam head injury study looked at all the soldiers that had spinal cord injuries in Vietnam. And if you followed them long enough, a certain percentage of them would develop a syrinx when they, they're paraplegic. And I tell you, I go over to the Veterans Administration Hospital and I treat veterans with syringomyelia from trauma. Might have been shot blown up in Iraq or Afghanistan. And a year later, two years later, they develop a syrinx. And how do I know they develop a syrinx? If you can't feel your lower body, how do you know? Well, they start developing neurologic problems that ascend. So they go up. All of a sudden, they were moving their arms, but they have weakness in their arms now. Well, that's a syrinx that expands. So the most common things that we see syringomyelia from is trauma trauma, it's bad trauma, okay, you know, diving into the pool, you know, and breaking your neck, getting blown up, 
driving a motorcycle, um, wiping out on a four-wheeler. There are some congenital. So in the children, we see what I call congenital syrinxes. Uh, I probably see once a week a child or a teenager or a young adult with the syrinx that we have no etiology. So we don't know why it caused. They said, I never had trauma. I never hurt myself. Yet they have, you know, they might have a syrinx in the lower part of their spinal cord and they might have incontinence occasionally or they might have difficulty, you know, they can't touch their toes or they have intractable back pain. So in the, in the fact that there is a syrinx and the children have syrinx, or any kind of a surgical procedure to be done, is it really dependent on their symptoms and also considering the size of the syrinx? Well? So, so the question is, when do you operate on a syrinx? It's a great question. I wish I knew. And when I recommend operation on the syrinx, it's the stool again. You got to come in and tell me how bad their symptoms are. They got to have some neurologic problem, and the MRI's got to show a big syrinx. Because cutting through a normal cord just to get a tiny little sliver of a syrinx doesn't help the patient. But the ones we operate on directly, are often the ones that are expanding, getting worse. The cord is, you can see through the cord, it's so thin, and it's like a distended balloon. So every neurosurgeon does it differently, but those are the ones that I'm operating on. People with progressive neurologic deficits, a bigger syrinx, symptoms that are horrific. But it's, again, the patient and the doctor kind of making the judgment. What we don't do, we want to avoid operating on tiny little syrinxes, holes in the spinal cord. Now, that's one of the most difficult things for patients. They hurt. But doctor, I hurt. I really, really hurt. The risks of that operation far outweigh the benefits. You do an operation if the benefit's going to far outweigh the risks. So you can have a tiny syrinx. Size doesn't always matter in syringomyelia. You can have a small syrinx and have horrible pain. You can have a big syrinx and be relatively asymptomatic. Uh, it seems like syrinx is a big subject here today, maybe bigger than anything. Uh, you, you mentioned operate on a syringe, and I, I never know that anybody actually did that. I thought that just emptied it. Could you explain what was So someone asked, what do you do when you operate on a syrinx? Well, there are a few operations for syringomyelia. Now, let's be clear again. If you have a Chiari, and 60% of my patients with Chiaris have syrinxes, some places it's only 10%, some places it's higher. If you have a Chiari, you treat the Chiari, and the syrinx spontaneously goes, gets better. That's the goal. The goal is not to operate on the syrinx if you have a Chiari. You want to avoid that at all costs. That's the last resort operation. Then the question was, what if you have a traumatic syrinx? You're a soldier. You're in a wheelchair. And you're getting worse. And all of a sudden, you can't wheel your wheelchair because your arms are getting weaker. And the doctor does an MRI and sees the syrinx is expanding. It's now bigger. We either do, if it was a fracture that caused it, we'll go in and do an operation and fix that fracture or de increase the space around the spinal cord so the syrinx collapses, or we'll directly puncture the syrinx and put a tube in to drain it. Okay. Now, what's the problem with putting a tube in a syrinx not in a patient with a Chiari, but a patient without it. The problem is that they last, if you look at the studies, in 10 years, 50% of them will be clogged. You talk about shunts that fail, syringo shunts fail. 50% of them will fail at 10 years. I have some patients that have gone back, they, you know, broken their backs, their syrinx keeps filling up. We go back two, three, four, five times in 10 years to fix their shunts. Not a good thing. 
It's not a good thing to have. I know that the symptoms are variable. Uh, is it common for them to be transient? And why is it that they're uh, not always... The question, uh, Jennifer... The neurological exams don't always find... Yeah, they, so... They, they prove to be negative. Right. So, so your exam, you can have, remember we talked about the pain definition. Jennifer asked, uh, she has said, how come the symptoms can come and go and you can examine so and not find, because they're symptoms. They're, remember, pain is here. It's right in your head. It's how your brain interprets pain. Not pain is you're crazy. It means pain is interpreted by your brain. And it's a reaction to prevent injury, or it might be residual to injury that already occurred. Okay, so it's a symptom. You can do an exam and find nothing wrong with the patient, and they can still have pain. <coughs> so symptoms can come and go because you can do things to make things worse. You can strain, you can cough, you can do whatever, and injure yourself. It's the same thing with, you know, the brain is not a muscle. It's not a tendon, but it's the same thing if you rip your hamstring and you're doing great, it's all healed, and then you do something to flare it up again. Same thing in the brain. So comes and goes, and you can do an exam and it'll be absolutely stone cold normal. And you know, and one minute, wow. You see, the, we're all at the mercy of the tape. <laughs> Everybody, thank you very much for coming. I hope this was in some way useful. It's been a real honor to talk to you. and. Uh